I don't know that I like the red. Maybe. I kind of always like the blue. Yeah, I don't like the green. Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Ham Radio Dude. Thank you for checking out the channel. I do appreciate it so much. Last week, I did a video on the Redivis RT47V. It's a very simple MERS radio from Redivis that's IP67 rated. So today, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw this thing in water for 30 minutes and we're going to see how it actually holds up underwater. Additionally, I'm going to hack this thing for 2 meters, 1.25 meters, and try for 70 centimeters and see how this operates. Additionally, let's test out the battery and see if it really is an 1100 milliamp hour battery. Let's go ahead and get started. And if you would consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. But if you didn't like the channel, hey, thanks for at least checking it out. Like my other videos, I took this radio and I placed it into the water for 30 minutes. Now an IP67 rated radio, at least the water portion of it, should be submersible for 30 minutes up to one meter in depth. I didn't have a meter uh, fish bowl or whatever you want to call it. So I did use this bowl that I use for all my videos. And I placed it in there with the radio powered off, put the battery in, and I double checked to make sure all the connections were tight for a good seal. Let's go ahead and let this time lapse finish, and I'll come back and we'll talk about the results. When I took the radio out of the water, I was expecting to see, obviously, water on the radio, but I was expecting to have the speaker, when you turn it on, sound a little muffled, and that's because moisture, or water I should say, gets into the area where the speaker is. And so when the audio was outputting, it's kind of muffled. Uh, that's happened on multiple radios and it's actually really common. It's not a huge deal. It'll dry out. But this time, when I turned this radio back on, it was crystal clear. I was really surprised. Usually you have to let it dry for a few hours before it sounds good again. Uh, I did try to transmit on this radio immediately and it was transmitting with no problems. There was no water in the battery terminal area. Neither was there any water in the microphone area or the area where you'd hook up your programming cable. And finally, there was no moisture in the antenna area. So I was actually really impressed. In fact, this is one of my best performing IP67 radios yet. Maybe the best being the Olinko DJVX50 that I've tested out so far, but also maybe the HD1. But you're looking at a $34 radio that just performed waterproof wise as well as the other ones. So again, very impressive. Now let's go ahead and see if we can hack this thing. One of the problems I knew I was going to run into with these little MERS radios was MERS is narrowband, whereas amateur radios or two meter radios typically need wideband. So I took a look inside the installation folder for the Redipus software, and I found a settings file, which I was very surprised to see what was inside. Basically, every variable that's in the software was modifiable through the settings file. So if I wanted to enable wide mode, I could just use a one instead of a zero. If I wanted to enable the frequencies to modify on the software, I could use a one instead of a zero. And the list goes on and on and on. I even added 15 channels to this radio. Now, test enable mode is something that if you enable, you should be able to hit control T inside of the software and be able to be in a developer mode of sorts, but I could not get that to work. So if anybody has any suggestions on that, let me know in the comments below. It's now that I realize I can go through the software and I can start changing all the settings to make this a 2 meter radio, 1.25 meter radio, instead of a MERS radio. And so I go through and do that. But what good is this if we don't hook this up to a spectrum analyzer and see if it's even worth doing it? I start my test using a MERS frequency, 151.82, and I test on a very narrow window and everything looks good. And then I said to myself, what would happen if I pulled the window out? And this is where I start to see yeah, there's a little bit of spurious emissions even on MERS. I should mention that all these tests I conducted were with narrowband. As I did one test with them, I figured I would do the rest with them. I move over to 144.985, and even with that narrow window, boy, there's already some spurious emissions. So I do expand it out to 1.5 gigahertz span, and it does show that this radio probably shouldn't be used on two meters. So now we're gonna say, hey, 
let's go ahead and just check the 220 band since I have this on a meter and check out this video. Objectively, I'm no rocket scientist. In fact, I don't think a rocket scientist is needed to determine you should not use this on 1.25 meters. And I'm going to repeat it. Don't use this on 1.25 meters. I did try this on UHF or the 70 centimeter band as well. And what I will say about this is this radio would not work on the 70 centimeter band. This is the part that I really enjoy because I now get to take apart a radio and check a couple things. First of all, I get to check and see if there's any water damage inside. And then I get to go on and take a look at all the parts and see what makes this radio tick. And is there anything cool I could do with the radio? I had a viewer ask me about the quality of my Sony ZV-1 camera versus my old camera, the Canon Mark III, and so I just wanted to point out that I now had to switch to the Sony ZV-1 because the Mark III just wouldn't focus correctly on the components, as you could see. I get super excited because here I see, yeah, 136 and 174 megahertz, but more importantly, I see on the right hand side, SDA, ground, 3.3 volts, clock, INT, battery low, TXD, RXD, microphone, and all these things together make me believe that this should be easy to eventually convert to an all-star node. Or just hook it up to an Arduino or Raspberry Pi to see what kind of data is being pushed through it and what could be modified. Sounds like I have an idea for a future episode. I took a look at the speaker and it looks like it's a 5 ohm 1 watt speaker. I'm thinking I might be able to upgrade this in the future as well. I was unable to tell what the model number of the board was and so I took a little q-tip with some rubbing alcohol and I cleaned the area where the model number starts. After I cleaned it I was able to determine that it says A190. Now I'm 99% certain that this is going to make for an easy all-star node installation or build. So I'm not going to take apart the rest of this radio now to get a look at the other side of the board and to see what chips they use because I'm just going to do it in a later episode anyway. Now, as we'll recall from last week, the battery is rated at 1100 milliamp hours according to the battery itself, as well as documentation online and in the user manual. And I wanted to see if that was kind of close. So I went ahead and I charged this thing up three separate occasions and I hooked it to a continual load tester on three separate occasions and at 0.2 amp hours or 200 milliamp hours of current, I got somewhere around 990 to 1000 uh, milliamp hour. I would consider that number relatively close, especially for a continual load tester being used that was relatively inexpensive. So what did we learn today? Well, first of all, I think we learned that my office is a mess and it really needs to be cleaned. We learned that this radio was able to sustain being underwater for 30 minutes, not quite at a meter, but I am pretty confident that there wouldn't be any issue with it being at a meter. I learned that a duck's quack never echoes. I learned that this radio is probably going to be easily modifiable to be working with All Star or communicate on an Arduino or Raspberry Pi, which gives the potential for so many future projects. I learned the Canon G7X Mark III is potentially the worst camera you could buy to do YouTubing with. Actually, I'd learned that one quite a while ago. We learned that Redivis actually locks down their radios via software and configuration files as opposed to actually locking them down on the radio, which makes them very easily modifiable. But with that, we also learned that this radio doesn't look too good on 2 meters or on 1.25 meters on a spectrum analyzer. 
I didn't put it in the video, but I did try to modify this thing for 70 centimeters, and I was unsuccessful in doing so. If you did make it all the way to this point, what does that mean? Well, it means you're at the end of my video. But more importantly, what it means is, is you made it through a whole Ham Radio Dude episode, and I'm thinking there must have been something there that intrigued you, or kept your interest, maybe you just like the sound of my voice. Whatever the reason is, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time. I'm Ham Radio Dude 73.